science enthusiasts. Welcome to Spaces Unleashed. Every week on Twitter, we bring an expert to chat live through the Spaces program. And this is bonus content that goes with the Science Podcast. We hope you enjoy the show. We've got Dr. G here. Is it, should I call you Jen, Dr. G, Dr. Golbeck? G Jen R is mom? great. <laughs> Jen is okay? <laughs> yeah. You've got a bunch of different names. Um, I've got Jen from The Golden Ratio um, here. Talk a little bit about her, her area of science first. And I have some general interview questions. That way we don't have the same questions asked over and over and over again of the guest. After about 20 minutes, I'll open up the floor to everybody who wants to ask a question. Uh, can can try to request the mic. Let's get things get things right going. Where are you in the world? For people that don't know where you are located, like uh, where are you in the world? We are mile marker seventeen in the Florida Keys, uh, Sugarloaf Keys. So we're pretty close to Key West, close to the southernmost point of the United States. <laughs> I love when I see pictures of the dogs and there's like palm trees, and I'm like, where the heck is this? Because it's so <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so really, alien. It's tropical paradise. Yeah, it's exactly the opposite of Canada, which is also very <laughs> beautiful. But uh, yeah, we grow our own coconuts here. <laughs> yeah, they're shipped up to us and they taste bad because it's like <laughs> so so far away. I would love for you to talk to everybody about what you do as a computer scientist. Like what what got you into that area of science? So a couple questions there. Yeah, I I will say I had a, a sort of unusual path. I went to the University of Chicago for undergrad, which is a an odd place. Um, it's very hyper intellectual and very theoretical. It was exactly the right place for me. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually started off as an economics major. That's where the uh, Freakonomics guys were. If you listen to their stuff, oh, yeah. or have read their books, and and I found I was really interested in the kind of behavioral side of economics, but not so much the money side. And also was very good at computers and and had been programming since I was a little kid, and so kind of changed my whole major my fourth year to computer science. Wow. Um, I was summarily rejected from grad school. You know, <laughs> I, I had like not taken any courses. It's a terrible strategy, um, <laughs> but uh, kind of. I was a very good teacher and so kind of made this bargain that they'd let me get a master's degree, which I did much better at if I taught a bunch of classes um, and then went on to get my PhD at the University of Maryland in computer science. And uh, I got I started my PhD in 2001 and I was working in an artificial intelligence research group. And I was oh, like, cool. No, Social networks are pretty cool. I wonder what would happen if we put one of those on the web, which was like not a thing at the time. And my advisor was <laughs> like, yeah, go ahead, try it, see what happens. So the timing was really perfect that, you know, MySpace, I mean, Frenzer and then MySpace and, and eventually Facebook kind of emerged on the web right at that time that I was interested in this. I actually built my own social network at the time to do research on. Um, really? And so, yeah, it was called um, Movie, what was it called? Film Trust. And you could like rate movies and rate how much you <laughs> trusted so cool. other people about movies. And it would like recommend stuff to you based on who you trusted. Um, it had like 2000 members, which I was like super proud of. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, so I really did my read on what has become, I think, a scourge on society, which is a lot of <laughs> these, uh, you know, all, the algorithm that controls like your Facebook news feed now, your Instagram uh. news feed. I did some of the initial work on that, but look, I mean, it's also the work that like helps you pick movies on Netflix and helps you, mm. you know, find stuff on the web. So it's got good applications, but yeah. basically I do artificial intelligence on social media. Um, and I'm a big privacy advocate because obviously that goes hand in hand with that kind of research. Okay. So you, you were, you were programming stuff like pre, like when you were young, you said, right? Like you were doing stuff when you were a young person with computers. Like, are we talking like you were in middle school or younger? Like you're, you're just I, kind of <laughs> putzing around on computers back then or. Yeah. My dad brought home a Commodore 64. Oh. On, uh, just before Easter, I think 1983, 1984, <laughs> I was six years old. Um, and I wrote a computer program. It was just an infinite loop that print that printed happy Easter. That's why Aww. I remember the day. Uh, that was my first computer program when I was <laughs> six. And so I, you know, I kind of mindlessly poked around and like tried to learn stuff, but, um, you know, so much of computer science, I, I think, frankly, a lot of science, but um, 
I find it, especially in computer science, like people who are good at it, um, it's because they feel free to tinker, right? Like mm. you don't care if you break it, I think that's <laughs> going to happen. You're just going to try some stuff out and see what happens. And, uh, and I'm definitely like that. And that I think is like a critical attribute to have to be good at computer science. You have to just try stuff and experiment and see what happens. You're not going to break anything, but if you're too cautious, you're never going to figure out how anything works. And so that made me very comfortable with computers, um, you know, kind of my whole life. Can you, that's such a, that's just an amazing trajectory. Like you started with a script that just repeated happy Easter and now you're working with artificial intelligence. <laughs> that's amazing. It's, you know, I just like when the web, so the, the World Wide web, right. That, that was invented and kind of introduced to the world in 1991. And I started building web pages like professionally quote unquote, people paid me to do it. Uh, when I was high, in high school in 1993 wow. And I just taught myself how to do that, right? And that's that's a lot of how this works is like, oh, here's this new cool thing. I want to do that. I'll teach myself to do it, even if you kind of suck at it, like you practice <laughs> and you get better. And uh, I, I have always chased the thing that I think is really exciting to me intellectually. And I've been, oh, man. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I could say that I'm I'm very smart about it, but I think really is that I'm lucky that the things that that spark in me intellectually are also things that have been really important, you know, both in my field and kind of in the world, um, which has made my work really hmm. relevant. Right. And, and you have to not give up too. like all of that stuff. Like what you said, you, you're not going to break anything, but it may not work for days. <laughs> you might have some oh, bug you've got to yeah. find. Right. So you have to, I mean, yeah. Um, perseverance in, in, well, all areas of science usually don't work. Um, a lot of the time, but um, but with computer science, I guess it's that, you know, you have to have that perseverance to find those bugs and fix the problems and new, learn the new thing. I, I mean, I think you're right. Like you've really got to put your ego aside in science because most of what you do is not going to work, right? You're going to have some big <laughs> theory and it just, will just be wrong or you'll screw stuff up. I mean, when I was doing my dissertation, I simulations and it took like three months for them to complete, right? Like I started <laughs> the code running at the beginning of the summer and in August, when they finished, I realized I had put a plus sign instead of a minus sign, it, you know, in one line of my 10,000 lines of code and everything was wrong and I had to throw it out. I lost an entire summer's worth of work oh, because of a typo. Yeah. And you just like that happens, right? It happens with in every kind of science that you have a little error and you have to just redo it. And you just got to be like, put your even redo it and, and care about the result and not about yourself. Hmm. Yeah, it's about the journey. It's cliche, but it's sometimes the journey that gets you to the end, not necessarily the yeah. little bumps along the way. <laughs> um, sure. I'll just tell a quick story. Uh, what, I forget what year it was, but I got into doing computer programming when I was in like grade eight or nine. And I made a video game of a skier that because it's Canada, right? So a skier <laughs> that went, that went down a hill. And it, and that's as far as I got, it was endless. All you did was ski. I wanted trees to, <laughs> I wanted trees to take you out, but he would just phase through the trees and it would just go forever. And I was like, Oh, that's kind of cool. And then I just, you know, that was the end of it. So, <laughs> um, that's but, that, amazing. but that's like pages of code. I remember pages and pages of code to get that thing to work. So yeah, oh, yeah. Te technology's come a long ways. Hey, can I ask, <laughs> can I ask you another question? Um, yeah. people who follow that you've been on television a few times, um, as an expert is, is there, could you talk to us about one of those experiences? Yeah. So, you know, in addition to my like work on artificial intelligence, I, I do a lot of research into, uh, I mean, I sort of summarize as like bad stuff people do on the internet. <laughs> uh, so I keep my, my fingers in a lot of those spaces and we've done research in my lab on, online harassment, um, you know, the alt-right movement, um, trolls and bots and Russian interference, all of this stuff is, is kind of in this space of what we would call malicious online behavior, if you want the fancy mm -hmm. academic term. And so what that means is that I spend a lot of my time reading the forums of really deplorable people. Oh, um, does that, get, does that bring you, that. does that bring you down, Jen? It, it's a huge problem. I and mean, in group, we actually have like mental health protocols about like how long you can spend doing it before you need to take a break and kind of hmm. check-ins and everything. Cause it, it can be extremely overwhelming. Um, 
and you know, some of it, like if we, you know, talk about the stuff I've been on TV about a lot of that's been talking about QAnon in the last, um, you know, months, I guess the last year. So you kind of know what to expect there, right? It's like upsetting stuff can be sort of enraging stuff, but then you will occasionally stumble in those spaces onto much more extreme kinds of like abuse or violent content that you're not expecting. Um, and that, that can be really disturbing for a long time. So we, uh, you know, we, we do our best to avoid it, but when we do encounter it, like we have processes in place to try to make it easier. Um, but you know, part of that process is that I then know the stuff that everybody kind of suspects is going on, but they don't, you know, reasonably don't want to get in there and read all of it. So I'm like your local resident expert on bad stuff that happens on the internet. Um, and, and that, you know, especially in the last year, obviously with, with, the insurrection here in the U S and then, um, you know, with a lot of the COVID stuff too, I've been the person that they can go to, to kind of say smart stuff about it and, you know, not have the agenda of the people who are talking, but to kind of report as a scientist, here's the stuff that they do. So I've been on MSNBC a lot, I think CNN Mm. once, you know, here in the U S and then, you know, some international things as well, especially after the insurrection, that was a busy time for me to just, kind of explain the whole movement that led up to what was going on here. Oof. That was that in January? I forget. Yeah, so I did a lot of stuff in, um November right after the election and then yeah, the insurrection was January 6th and so yeah. it, you know that that immediate time was very busy for that kind of work. Yeah. That's a I don't know if that would happen in Canada. It's just too cold. Like you just, <laughs> you'd need your mitts and your snow pants and it'd be like minus 40. You'd have to shovel your way to the apartment building. Like just, it, it's not worth it. So anyways, <laughs> <laughs> anyways. Um, so you, you mentioned that you have some expertise and a passion about privacy. Do, I was, I, I do have a question about something that you feel people like from, from your area of expertise, what do you think people should know? Um, do you think it's stuff about privacy? Oh, I mean, it's like, on one hand, we all sort of know, right, that like data is being collected about us everywhere. And, you know, we all get like the ads where it said they know that like, that's the exact thing I want when I didn't even realize that's the thing I want, right? (laughs) All of that's from this artificial intelligence and all this data that you leave behind um, and or that, you you know, you don't even know that's being siphoned from you. And I, I guess the thing I like to tell people is that you kind of know how bad it is. And it's actually like a hundred times worse than you think it is. Oh no. Um, it, it's so bad. Uh, so if I can just, I'll give you one quick example. Like Facebook has a patent to try to figure out, I mean, what, they have a lot of patents to try to figure out who you're friends with that you're not connected with yet. And one of them will analyze photos that get posted on Facebook. So like you and I are not friends on Facebook, but if someone took my picture and someone took your picture kind of at the same time, both posted those pictures with acted. Facebook will analyze like the invisible traces left behind from the dust and scratches on the lens of the camera that was used to take our photos. And it can identify that we each had our picture taken by the same camera at about the same time. And so maybe we know each other and then suggest that we become friends. Like, the depths <laughs> to Boom. which that technology goes to find these things out. And that's just like one example of about three hours worth of stories like that, that I have. Um, it's oh, so huge. And, you know, so there's like, there's some steps that we can take, but it's the kind of thing that, you know, in the can in Canada and the U S um, we're kind of to the point where we need like way better regulation over that to just like rein in the power of these companies. And we're not going to get there until people really know just how abusive they are in the background. And I love social media, right? Like we're, I'm on it all the time. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're doing some bad stuff. You know, they're doing a lot of different bad stuff, but the <laughs> privacy side is one of those. And, and, uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, the next few years where I think we are going to see some regulation to, to rein them in. Cause it's scary mm. what we can do with you know, the tech that I build, it can be used in profoundly good ways. And then also, you know, really creepy, disruptive ways. Right. Like just from an AI perspective, how it's changing science for the better. Right. I, I talked to uh, epigenetics uh, uh, researcher and just filling in all the little data gene, gene codes with AI. There's it's not something you could have done without, you know, those neural nex- networks a few years ago, um, which is going to have a profound effect on that area of science. But then and then you, you can take that little bit of doodaddy stuff and then 
do some pretty nefarious stuff with privacy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, and I, I certainly like to tell the scary stories. Um, I mean, it's, it's both important and entertaining, but yeah, I mean, on the science side, like there, there's a study that recently came out in the UK where they used artificial intelligence to analyze brain scans of patients with memory issues and their AI can diagnose Alzheimer's like six years before symptoms emerge with what? like 98% accuracy. So like people who, who don't know that they have problems yet, right. Who maybe are just having, you know, they're forgetting their keys. They go to the doctor, they can find out if they're going to go on to develop Alzheimer's and that allows them to get treatment earlier. Mm. And it just allows them to like plan their life, right. If you know, you're going to get Alzheimer's in six or eight years, you may decide to do different things with your life in the intermediate time. And that's, yeah. that's the power of this tech when you have a lot of data. So it's, it's doing just amazing world changing things on the science side, but also on the, you know, capitalism surveillance <laughs> profit side. And, and we have to, you know, figure out what are the rules that we want to follow. Oh man. I hate that. When I'm like talking to my wife, I was like, Hey, we should get this thing. And then I'm on Facebook cause my family's on Facebook and Facebook is like, Hey, have you thought about this from Amazon? I'm like, are you listening? <laughs> are you listening they totally, to me? Totally are. They're yeah. probably listening to me. Uh, okay. I've got a couple more questions before we open the floor to everybody. Um, I'm just going to reset kind of the room and explain what's going on. I have Dr. Jen Goldbeck from the Golden Ratio uh, here. We're just doing a quick little mini interview about some things from her life. I know a lot of people are probably m most interested in talking dogs, but you do some such amazing work. I wanted to pick your brain about that. And if you ever have some spare time, Jen, I'd love to talk to you on our podcast about all of this privacy stuff. Um, when you have time, I know you're very busy. Um, hey, I'm on sabbatical this year, so I have time. Sabbatical all right. I'll, thing. <laughs> all right. We'll, we'll connect some more. My, my other question is you are big into running. Um, um, you actually have a third, third account, right? Jen runs with dogs. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, and so have you been a runner your whole life? Is that something you picked up a little bit later since when, since when you were, you know, a teenager? Um, I, yeah, I ran like cross country and track okay. in like school, um, and then sort of gave it up. Um, and when I was in, I guess when I was in graduate school in Chicago, like I ran the Chicago marathon, literally ran on the street that I lived on. So I walked outside and there's oh, all cool. marathon runners. I was so inspired. I was like, I'm going to do that next year. <laughs> like I hadn't run in, you know, six years. Uh, and so st literally started training the next day and ran my first marathon the next year and was completely hooked. And so I've been distance running since, I guess that was 2000 the year is when I did my first marathon and I've been distance running since then. Wow. I have such respect for people that run even a half marathon. If I, like I run on the treadmill as part of my workout regime and it's 10 minutes, right? And I can maybe watch a little bit of Netflix, but this is like a whole other thing. <laughs> do you have a big, yeah, I, do you have a big run coming up? I think, I think I swear I, th I saw you were training for something, but I could be wrong. Yeah. I, I've, uh, you know, I got into ultra running. So um, normally I run very far, like la a year ago, I ran a hundred mile race. So all at once what? I ran for 35 hours, uh, oh my for goodness. Miles. How? Um, I've been, you know, it's, we can talk more about it if you want, but it's, it take, you know, it took me probably five years to train up to it. Oh, and, practice. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, uh, the nice thing about running is if you get better, you just do more of it. And, uh, <laughs> but it was hard. I mean, I hallucinated, I, you know, passed <laughs> out. Uh, I'm taking it easier this year. So, um, on Monday I'm running the Boston marathon and it's going to be my first time running Boston uh, and so excited. Oh, congratulations. I, I didn't want to let the cat out of the bag for people that didn't know. I think I was creeping that on your profile, getting ready for this interview. <laughs> so, um, when you run, Hey, I got a question for you, Jen, when you run those, those distances, uh, like, do you listen to music? Do you listen to podcasts or do you just run and you just are with yourself? Like, I just, I'm it's, so curious about that. Uh, yeah, I, I do audio books. I mean, it's 35 hours, right? I can listen to two entire audio books <laughs> <laughs> in the amount of time it takes to run a hundred miles. Oh my goodness. Um, when I'm training, I, I definitely do podcasts. Um, but for the, for the longer races where I'm going to be running like 12 hours or more, um, you know, once we hit like 50 miles and above, I, I absolutely will like save like very plot driven audiobooks. So Stephen King, Michael Connelly, mm. like those where it's like, I don't have to think too hard. I can 
pick up what's going on, um, like really compelling ones that I save those for the, for the long races. Yeah. You probably wouldn't want like the council of Elrond from Lord of the Rings yeah. when you're trying to run. <laughs> it was like, how many people are talking? Exactly. What? It's kind of taking the, oh, what's this? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, are, okay, so I I just had a question come in. I just want to ask you. There at some people are asking, can people can they follow you in the Boston Marathon? Like, um, do you have a number yet? Like, can we look for you? Uh, do you know anything about that? I do. Yeah. So if you go to the if you just find the Boston Marathon website, um, they do have like a live tracker, um, just like the Iditarod, because I'm sure you've got a lot of ugly dogs who are listening who, who follow Blair and her races. Um, uh-huh. But, yeah, you can go to the Boston Marathon website um, and uh, and just find me in there and there will be a live tracker. I, I start pretty late there because of covid. They've sort of changed the race. So mm. I'll start like 10 or 1030 in the morning. Um, you know, normally these races, Oh, they're, stag- they're staggering them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll start around 10 and yeah, you'll be able to see a live tracker. So I think it'll probably update every five or 10 K and you'll be able to see where I am. And it's a straight, the nice thing about the Boston marathon is it's a straight line you go from Hopkinton straight into Boston. And so it's a, a nice, like linear path, no curves or anything. <laughs> okay. Awesome. I'll take, I'll check that out. We'll tweet that out to our followers so people can follow you. Cool. Best of best of luck. If I forget to wish you best of luck be- before this ends. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So the last question, and this could go on for hours, um, is about the golden ratio. Um, for people that don't know who you are, and people who have who have dropped in, we've got we've got three hundred and fifty people listening right now, and maybe not everybody follows the golden ratio. Can you tell everybody what the show is and and what you do with with your amazing work with these dogs? Yeah, so the Golden Ratio is uh, our little social media empire for our dogs. Um, they're the Golden Ratio for on every social media platform. Um, and uh, basically, it's however many Golden Retrievers we have at the time. We have six right now. We rescue them, and we tend to take in um, kind of difficult cases. So seniors, hospice cases, complex medical issues. So right now we have, um, we have a amputee. <laughs> she, she just got her leg amputated last week. Um, we've got a blind diabetic. We have an epileptic. We've got a couple like high anxiety dogs. And then we have Vinkman who, who we got as a puppy and is just a, a charming ray of sunshine and, uh, part of our transition team. And, um, you know, we've got a pretty stable group right now, but we do take a lot of hospice cases or like very old dogs, um, you know, 13, 14, 15 year old Goldens, which is the most geriatric end. And so, um, you know, we don't always have them for a super long time because we get them when they're sick or kind of at the end. But, um, you know, for us, it's, it's sort of turned into this life mission of getting these dogs who have, you know, almost always some pretty neglectful backgrounds and sometimes some very abusive backgrounds and, uh, and just transforming them. Like our house is, is really like a, a pace of like peace and kindness and comfort. And we like to bring these dogs in and, and really show them that like whatever their years have been like in the past, like that's not what they are anymore. Like this is a place where they get yelled at. They're just going to be like loved and given whatever they want and swim in the ocean and be loved by all these other dogs. And, uh, we try to take however long they haven't had the love for and cram that into however much time we get with them. And it's, it's amazing. You know, I think dogs in general are resilient, but Goldens especially, um, within a month you see them go from these kind of scared, withdrawn, sad dogs to just blossoming into these happy, goofy, playful, affectionate, so grateful dogs, um, who really embrace their new life, even if their circumstances are tough. Oh my goodness. It's, it's, it's bringing tears to my eyes. Um, my, my, we have, we have Beaker who's a golden and we had a golden before, before we got Bunsen. It's just like, I have such a special place in my heart for those dogs. Um, and that you, you bring them into your house and, and save them and bring out their inner gold, right? Their, their gold is there all the time. And you guys, you, through your work that you just get them to shine and just from the whole dog community. Thank you for the work that you do. It's just so amazing. We feel so lucky that we get to do it, right? I mean, there's so many dogs that need this and, and we, you know, I grew up with Goldens. I love them and we work with the Golden Rescue Group, but, um, 
you know, any, any kind of dog can make that transformation and, and being able to give that to them is, is such like a gift in our lives, right. That, that we get to be there and kind of have the honor of, of witnessing that transformation. It's really amazing. Ooh, I got to take a second here so I don't uh, like <laughs> get all verklempt. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to our show week after week. If you want to know how to support the Science Podcast, here are a couple ways. It's always going to be free to download, so you'll never have to worry about paying for it. But, you know, things do cost money running a podcast, and and here are a couple ways you could help us out. One is join our Patreon page. It's amazing. It's growing. It's almost like an extended family. There's multiple tiers of support, and we have lots of fun perks for being part of our Patreon page. The other way you could support us is giving us an awesome review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, anywhere you can rate our podcast. Give us a great review. The third way you could support the show is checking out the Bunsen Burner BMD.com website. We have awesome merch there. We work really hard finding quality merchandise that's comfortable with vibrant colors. And you'll find in limited quantities over the next couple months, maybe even less, the 2022 Bunsen and Beaker calendar. So three ways to support us. The Patreon page. Two, give us a great review. Three, head over to our merch stop and see if there's anything there you'd like. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to open up the floor to people who would like to ask questions. Um, some people have already uh, requested the, the mic. So we're going to go to Howie and then Paula and then Denise and John. Um and we have a giant room, so we may not get to everybody, and I'll try to go through. Okay, so we've got now 100,000 people asking. Okay, so who did I say first? That was uh, Howie. Okay. Um, so Howie, and, and before time, um, keep your questions short. Um, try not to too big of a story, because that happens sometimes. Um, and, and Jen, are you okay for um, at least, it looks like we're going to have at least 40 minutes of questions. Is that okay? Oh, of course. That's great. That's okay. All right. Awesome. Okay. Howie, uh, go ahead. I've added you as a speaker. It takes a second to buffer. So, um, yeah, once you, once you've got that, you got to unmute yourself and then ask your question, uh, Paula and then Denise. Go ahead, Howie. Okay. I got, I feel so privileged (laughs) in regards to this. Thank you. Um, you do great work, wonderful work. And, uh, your stuff in the show connected on Benford's law. I, I loved, I understood actually everything completely from your explanation. Um, I guess uh, w- one thing I ask, I guess, is since you talked about social media and regulation, um, if our members of Congress in the United States were actually smart, this is a loaded question on other things. <laughs> um, if you could recommend one one thing, I know that might be a loaded question itself, um, to, I guess, kind of help either rein in the power of social media or kind of regulated, as you would say, what would be the one thing you people should uh, advocate for their members of Congress to push for? It's a great question. And, and look, I mean, I think we do need like a whole suite of different rules. But for me, um, the one core thing would be to have a shift in the law in the U.S. where people own their own data. So that is the case in Europe now, like GDPR, their privacy law, and actually, you know, pre-GDPR. If if you're in Europe, data about you, you own, and you can tell companies to delete it. You can see what they're doing with it. You can tell them no. In fact, they have to get explicit permission, which does get us all those annoying cookie warnings. But the idea there is good. In the U.S., that's not the case. In the U.S., the law is once you share your data with a third party, like say a social media platform or an app, they own that data. And they can do whatever they want with it. And it doesn't matter what you say or what you want. And that allows all kinds of bad, creepy things to go on. And so if we just were to make that, and this is a very big change, even though it's like one kind of small sounding thing, make it so people in the U.S. own day themselves and, and get all the control that comes from that, um, that really lays the fundamental groundwork for a ton of the really necessary changes that we need in terms of privacy, um, controlling, you know, the algorithms and all the stuff you're seeing in the news, the way that we are manipulated with those algorithms, um, and, and cybersecurity too. I mean, our security becomes much stronger when we own that data as opposed to allowing it to be just passed around between shady companies who want to do that. So that, that would be the main thing to just have the fundamental right to control that that citizens own the data about themselves and not companies, everything flows from that. 
Wow. Uh, I, I guess I never knew it because I always thought that, you know, with data, you know, you actually had on some sites, I don't know, like maybe Google, that you could almost manage what that data is. And think, now you're telling me that it's not. It like kind of blows my mind. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, some you know, Google is is a company where obviously they have a ton of data about us, and you know, they they have problems, but they I think try to be responsible about it. Um, but you look at like the advertisers, the data brokers, you know, some of these smaller companies, and you know, big ones like Facebook, and they don't really take the the duty that they should to protect that data. And you know, Google has their own problems too. Um, but and you know, any of this creepy stuff they do. If if someone goes, hey, I, I didn't say you could do that. Change their terms of service, and that says, well, now and then mm -hmm. they can. Um, so you know that fundamental shift in order to to get the things that I us common sense expect that we have, and and we actually don't. Oh, wow, thank you very much. I learned something new every day. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the great question, Howie. <laughs> um, Paula, you're up. Uh, Howie, could you mute yourself? Thank you. Go ahead, Paula. Um, okay. Denise, Denise, you're next, and I think we'll go to John. You're on deck. So go ahead, Paula. Hi, Dr. Jen, and thank you for credit that Jason's got a huge space tonight. And uh, I think you're a sister of the parallel universe because I have lots of dogs and I do uh, sentries on my bike. So I kind of have a awesome. same, same thing. But anyway, my question to you is uh, I have a blind diabetic dog, too, and it, I find it so challenging. Um um, how did you come about like starting getting all your dogs? Do people say, gee, I have this dog and I don't want it anymore. And you kind of hear about it. And how did your little tribe grow over the years? And, you know, how did you get started in it? We, we've had a couple come in or come through that way. Um, but we actually work with a, a golden retriever rescue group. So even though we're down here in the Florida Keys right now, um, up until a couple of years ago, we were full time in um, Maryland, right by Washington, D.C. So there's a, a group that kind of covers the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. And uh, and so they take every golden in in that region and in, into West Virginia and Pennsylvania, for those of you who know the, the area. Um, so if somebody's giving one up, if it ends up on Craigslist, if the dog ends up in a shelter, any shelter in that space um, will spring <laughs> spring the dog and bring him into the rescue group. Um, so that's every golden. And then um, some mixes. For those of you who follow us, we, we got a dog who we named St. Patrick, who was wonderful that we thought was a golden doodle. He actually was a labradoodle. So he really like snuck into the, <laughs> to the squad. He wasn't a golden at all. Um, but they, they basically take any dogs to give up any dog that is abandoned, brought to a shelter, and then they get a foster home and we have a big pool of fosters. And there's a handful of us that, um, that kind of specialize in the difficult medical cases. And so, um, our current blind diabetic, he's our second one, but the first one we, I mean, we didn't know how to take his blood sugar. <laughs> They're like, here you go. Blind diabetic oh, yeah. dog. I can like, so oh, relate. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's so uh, daunting. So, it really is. <laughs> I mean, my poor husband, he picked the, he picked the dog up. So he drove from Key West to I, Roanoke or, so, you know, the, way out there in Virginia, picked this dog up and was bringing him back. And then we, Oh, we need to check his blood sugar. So my husband was testing himself like in the dark at a rest stop with the dog blood glucose meter. And we didn't know which do you put the test strip in first or second. The poor guy like poked himself like 20 times. And then Don's blood sugar was like, literally the meter just said high. It was so high that we thought he was going to die. Uh, and so, you know, we figured it all out, but um, you really oh, get dropped in the deep end of the pool when you take those those guys in um fortunately no, we're starting to have covered all of the issues right so oh we'll just know I, hey, I know it's it's the things you learn it's like <laughs> i'm not gonna keep time but it's like boy i'll tell you it's, it, the learning curve goes way up when you when you try stuff because we pricked our fingers a million times but a little hit yeah. the upper <laughs> lip is the easiest part the ear forget about it no <laughs> yeah so. we've we've uh settled on the elbow callus works really well yeah. ear to work either yeah good well <laughs> congratulations on everything i really i'm i'm like so great to be hearing all this and i just think you're wonderful so thank oh, you thank, thank you for taking you. my question take, take care of that sweet blind dog you have i sure will thank you thanks for your question paula uh not all superheroes wear capes but i think jen better get one what do you guys think oh <laughs> um denise you're up uh and then john you're on deck nelson you're third go ahead denise 
Hi, everyone. Hey, Jen, it's Denise Gear, and it's nice to talk to you in person. Hey, um, you too. So I got to tell you, your Commodore 64 story took me back. I was probably 12 or 13 when I got my baby Commodore, the VIC-20. And <laughs> the first thing I programmed on it was for it to be able to play the song, The Entertainer. And I remember the big three cartridge that you had to plug in, it had a tape recorder, and uh, it was the, it was the coolest thing at the time. <laughs> <laughs> we had the tape recorder too. And I remember, uh, so, you know, I think probably a lot of people who are on this space are younger than us and don't know what we're talking about, but you had, <laughs> you'd plug into your computer, a cassette deck, just, just like the cassettes that, you know, they probably didn't there. Probably don't know enough. what that is either, uh, but <laughs> you've seen them though. And that's what your program was on. And I remember we had like some video game, like math video game. And so you'd put the cassette in and you'd type whatever it was to load the game. And then we would go like make a sandwich and eat lunch because uh -huh. it took about 10 minutes <laughs> for the game to launch from that tape. <laughs> but it was so cool. Oh, it was so cool. Yeah. <laughs> so I have two totally unrelated questions for you. When is GR Dad gonna set up this wholesome only fan <laughs> account? And then the other question: um, What is going on with this Facebook whistleblower? Like I've seen somebody's in Congress. I don't know exactly what she's blowing the whistle on. Tell us a little bit about what what what's up with that. Sure. Uh, hey, Ingo, they want to know when you're gonna start your wholesome only fans. <laughs> so for for those of you who don't follow, uh, GR Dad is my <laughs> husband and. Uh, I keep teasing him that he should start an OnlyFans and, you know, he's like, I'm not getting naked on the internet. I'm like, no, it can be like you folding laundry and you like giving it on how to like take care of your car, wholesome clothed stuff. And uh, I don't, I don't think I'm breaking him down, but I talk about it with him on our podcast every week. Uh, well, I don't, the dad I don't jokes would go happen. far. <laughs> if we ever get um, like a Twitter whatever their new thing is where you can, uh, I guess a super follow, we're going to have a, a GR dad joke corner. So, so that may be coming even without only fans. Um, <laughs> in terms of the whistle Facebook this week. Um, so someone who has worked kind of on the business side of the stuff that I do, you know, these algorithms that um, control your newsfeed and, and basically what those are designed to do is figure out what's going to keep you on Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp the longest. Because uh, that's how they make their money. The more time you spend there, the more ads they show, the more data they collect, the more money they make. And it turns out, um, and we, there's a ton of research on this, that the things that you engaged the most are things that make you upset. Um, so extremist content, whether you agree with it or not, if you're going to argue with it, that counts as engagement. Um, and, you know, so she's, she's sort of shown that Facebook has done a ton of interns that show this, this happens. Um, there's one internal study, this this had come out even before her, that shows that like of the people who have joined far right extremist groups on Facebook, something like 68% joined them because Facebook suggested that they join them. Um, and that's, you know, automatically generated, but it's like, oh, hey, you are a member of like your state's Republican Party. How about you join this like neo-Nazi group? And some of them say, sure. And that's not good. Um and I think one of the more damning things she came out this week with this week was documentation on um, Instagram and that like if you're a teenage girl on Instagram, they're often going to drive you towards like pro eating disorder groups because, of course, you know, you grow up as a teenage girl and your body image is something you're bombarded with messages about it. And, uh, you know, I certainly was insecure about it as a 13 year old. And I think a lot of girls are, and they're like, Hey, here's some groups. I'm like, I just need to starve myself all the time. And like, I wish I were thinner and I wish I were pretty. And that it, and there's a ton of research outside of Facebook too, that shows social media is incredibly damaging to self-esteem at that age. Um, and they kind of feed on that. And she's really come out and said, Facebook knows that we're doing all of this really damaging stuff to society and to individuals and they just don't care. And shouldn't we do something about it? Um, I, you know, I, I don't know that she knows what the right solution is to that. And that's not critical of her. It's a hard problem to solve. Um, but it's good, you know, to see that internal documentation and hopefully, you know, bring more attention to the vast set of stuff that we have to do to try to address the impact that social media is having on, kind of us as individuals and then society as a whole.
Interesting. Well, it'll we'll see if it takes something really horrible, although maybe we already had the horrible with the insurrection, but something really, really awful to happen to cause a change with all of these social media companies. I, I kind of don't think that will ever happen, though, and it would almost take these companies getting a conscience, but since everything's driven by the big big dollar, um, yeah. there's probably no conscience to be found. I think that's right. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate it. And um, one more thing. What uh, compliments to Ingo or the slicing of Hopper's carrots? Oh. <laughs> so. <laughs> hey, the, so Hopper's our dog who just got her leg amputated. So she used to hold her, her carrots that she'd get after dinner between her paws. And so she only has one paw now. Um, so Ingo actually did not slice that carrot. He bit it himself into a bunch of pieces <laughs> and then gave her the pieces. <laughs> That's love. It's love. Aww. Terrific. Well, thanks. Good to talk to you, Jen. Um, appreciate it. I appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Thanks. Wow. Great question, Denise. I learned something. I heard on the news something about something with whistleblower. But you know, up in Canada, kind of just like uh, this time of the year, it's all about hockey. So sorry about that, <laughs> Americans. Um, John, go ahead. You're up. Andrew, you're on deck. Um, and then the Labrador farm is next. Well, people are talking. I'm going to be moving. Uh, people have already spoke out of being a speaker. I, it's not, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to make room for more people. Go ahead, John. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. And hey, Dr. Goldbeck, it's nice to uh, it's nice to speak to you again. Um, I had just a quick question. Like, how do you do all that you do? Because it, ju it just seems never ending. Um, and I try and keep up and I try and do a lot of the things that you do as well. And I, I suffer from burnout a lot of the time. So how do you do everything? It just, it, it blows my mind. I was going to say, John, you do as much stuff as I do. I feel like I, cause I follow you on all of your platforms and I'm like, he, I mean, you have like more sponsorship than we do and you're doing these ad spots and you're doing photo shoots and you're like out in the community. And I was like, man, like I'm not doing that much stuff. And so, you know, I think part of it is, um, you know, we do the stuff that, that kind of naturally comes, right? Like I, you know, you, you seem to have a lot of passion about like your local community and supporting like businesses and organizations there. And that may make it like come more naturally to you. Where if like I tried to do that here, it would be a huge amount of work for me to like make those connections and, and get out and, and do that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I think part of it is we, we sort of pick our things, but I will say that me, uh, part of my, coping mechanisms for dealing with stress is to do projects, right? Like I'd love to have a project when something really stressful comes along, I will usually start a new project and I like finishing projects. And so, uh, that's why I have like 50 Instagram accounts and, and all of these social media platforms because I get stressed and I'm like, you know, it would be great is if I did this project. And, uh, and so, so maybe the fact that I do so much is a, a secret signal to the outside world of like how stressed I get about some of the other things I do. Cause it's a good way, you know, and I'm tired of like reading QAnon, uh, which happens very quickly. Then I can, you know, come over and, um, you know, take pictures of the dogs or, or whatever, make a cocktail and, and put a picture of that up on an account and it kind of helps calm me down. So I, I feel like I have wisely found ways to make my, coping mechanisms also things that are like fun and other people sort of enjoy um and it, it makes me look really productive when i'm really just like dealing dealing with my own stuff <laughs> yeah yeah no that's that's totally fun. and uh yeah no we just super appreciate i know a couple other people have said it but we super appreciate everything you do for you know all the dogs it's not uh it's not easy, but, uh, you know, you do such an amazing job. So we all, we all love you for it. Thank you. Same to you and, and hug both of those big giant dogs for us. Thanks, John. Great question. Great sentiment. Um, Nelson, you're up. Andrew, you're on deck. Uh, Pav Pavlov, you're in the wings. Uh, go ahead, Nelson, then Andrew, then Pavlov. Hello, I'm Victoria, Nelson's mom. Nelson Vi Victoria, I'm sorry, Victoria. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's fine. Um, 
So, Jen, I have a very specific question about the dog experience. Um, so, your dogs obviously live right next to the ocean, and they always get to have so many, so many swims, so many good times in the ocean. And Nelson and I don't go to the ocean very often, or the uh, bay, gulf, rather, uh, salt water. But he does like to go to the beach, and so we sometimes go to down to Port O'Connor, and he'll get in the seawater and all that. And uh, he's a bull terrier, so his skin can get irritated from literally anything. <laughs> but I always have to wash him off after we go to the beach, which is one reason we don't go that often, because it's kind of a logistical nightmare. So I wonder if your dogs, when they go into the ocean, do you, do you bathe them, like, all the time? <laughs> oh, my God. All right, so first, I love your content. It's thank it's so you. beautiful. So thank you for your account. Um, <laughs> we would do nothing else if we bathed the dogs every time they went into the ocean because it's yeah. like five times a day. Um, so it it depends on the dog. Like Guac, um, he's you know he's a a field golden, which means he's sort of like. Spe I mean, all goldens are kind of meant to be hunting dogs, but he's he's like an American variety that's got like slightly <laughs> shorter fur he's like tough for anything. So he really doesn't need it. Um, like if I were to lick his face, it'd be salty and, um, he'll get hosed down. So we try to hose them all down after the last swim of the day, just rinse him off, but he'll yeah. sometimes go a couple days. Um, Vinkman on the other hand, like she has super sensitive skin. Like our life is a battle of, of hot spots with her. Um, yes. even if she doesn't swim. So, um, Ingo, my husband, he, he gives her a bath most times that she goes swimming, um, or a very thorough rinse. Um, and chief Brody, that dog smells like a wet sock every time he gets wet. <laughs> like you can, he's the only dog who smells bad and you can smell him from across the house. So <laughs> we, we try to bathe him a lot, but we also found, um, and we have no partnership here, but I discovered nature's miracle. They make this stuff that like you put on like urine spots on your carpet, but they make a spray uh -huh. for your dog's fur. That, it is amazing stuff. And it's like $3 a bottle on Amazon. I don't know how it happens, but that stuff, we've got like a case of it. Um, and so that, that helps with the smell part, but it kind of is like dog sensitive. Their skin is, but we do keep the hose just like right down by, by the beach, um, in our backyard. So they at least, you know, get in fresh water rinse at the end of the day. Yeah. That's what I do with Nelson too. Not with a hose. I usually bring like jugs of water to the beach before I put them back in the carrier. <laughs> oh, that's so smart. Yeah. I mean, we're lucky. I mean, we are really grateful every day that like they can just go right into the ocean from the yeah. backyard. Uh, makes it easy. Well, that's all I got. I just always see your dogs in salt water and I think, gosh, that must be, difficult it, it is a bit of a project but i mean yeah. everything when you've got this many is right so yeah <laughs> nelson is enough for me and he's just one so <laughs> oh, give him yeah. i love him so much I'll do that thanks so much you guys yeah and give nelson give nelson some hugs from us too i love the plushie by the way victoria oh, i'm so excited <laughs> yeah congratulations on that thanks for thanks for your questions um andrew is up Pavla and the Labrador farm is on deck. We're going to try and get through as many people as we can. Um, everybody be patient. I'm trying my best to do it in some kind of order here. <laughs> uh, hi, Dr. Goldbeck. Um, my fiance and I are huge fans of y'all. And as 2020 grads, the golden ratio of graduation really brought joy in a Aww. pretty rough time. Uh, so thank you so, so much glad. for doing that. <laughs> um, my question is that in the landscape of the collection of our personal data by media companies, um, what are ways that we can, as individuals, protect our data? Yeah, so, you know, beyond, you know, we've talked a lot about, like, regulation, but it, just in terms of, like, on your own side, um, uh, you know, there's so much talk about what we put on SA, and I certainly advocate for doing as much ephemerally as you can. So, um, you know, obviously we post all these dog pictures. They're, they're up there all the time. Uh, but on a lot of like my personal social media channels, I'll use like stories or other disappearing content. Um, or I, I will use tools that delete it. Like I'm a big fan of deleting stuff on social media. Um, but 
that's sort of a small piece, like a huge amount of the data that's collected about us is on our phones and it's like trackers in the apps, just pulling data off our phones. And the magnitude of that is huge. Like just while you're sleeping, right? You're not using your phone while you sleep. There's usually like 5,000 trackers in the course of a week that are pulling data off of your phone. And it's everything. And it can track your movements. Even if you have, you know, location services turned off, they can track your location by looking at the Wi-Fi networks that your phone connects to. They read the other apps on your phone, just all of this stuff. And so one thing that, and again, no partnerships here, just like a tool that I really like, uh, I have an iPhone. There's a tool called um, Disconnect by Privacy Pro. Um, so if you search for dis Disconnect, it, it should come up. It's an app there's a paid version, but the free one works like it'll, it'll prompt you. Like, do you want to sign up? But you don't have to. And it blocks those trackers. And so it saves your data. It saves load time and it blocks all of that stuff from coming off. Um, you can find tracker blockers if you have an Android and you can also put them in your web browsers on your phone and like on your desktop. Um, and it will, I mean, literally you're going to block over a hundred thousand trackers a year <laughs> from collecting data about your habits. Um, and then, you know, the rest sort of depends on how much inconvenience you're willing to put up with. So, um, I've got some pretty aggressive blocks on, um, you know, like ad blockers and tracker blockers on my browser. So like if I wanted to order a pizza, I can't do that <laughs> because some websites just don't work. Um, but you know, I just go to a different browser for that. Um, if you, if, and, you know, getting a little beyond your question for people who are really concerned about this, I did a whole thing with, um, the great courses, which is a, a company here in the U S that does, um, kind of continuing education stuff of just like interesting topics on all kinds of, in all kinds of things. So I did one on, on protecting your personal data. So I think there's an audible version of it. So if like you have an audible subscription, you can get it there for like, you know, a credit. Um, but I think it's like 12 bucks or something. It's, it's pretty, pretty cheap. And, uh, and it's, I think 12, if you, if it were a podcast, it'd be like 12 episodes and there's like companion PDFs and stuff. And it tells you all the different things like that you as an individual can do, um, in terms of like VPNs and tracker blockers and social media tools and all of that to, to do as much on your side to minimize the collection of data, which can be pretty powerful, right? I mean, it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't reduce the need for regulation because, you know, these companies are powerful and will get stuff anyway, but, um, mm -hmm. it does make a difference. A lot of, a lot of this tech won't work on you if you really reduce your data fingerprint. So, um, so those are some options. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. What a great question, Andrew. Um, Jen, would you mind? I've get I'm getting direct messages by a bunch of people. Uh, what is that app again? <laughs> people are like, yes. yeah, what, what is it? Ah. <laughs> uh, what is it's it? Dis Disconnect by Privacy Pro. Um, Disconnect by Privacy Pro. Yeah, it's going to look like like a little green shield in a circle. I think is what their icon is, and I think it's only for the iPhone right now. I don't know that they have an Android version. Those worth checking. Um, but there will certainly, like, if you look for trackers in the Google Play Store, I'm sure you can find some for Android too. But I, I, I have an iPhone and I use Disconnect um, on my phone all the time. Uh, hey, Doc, have you do you have you ever watched the TV show Parks and Rec? Yes. All right, my favorite one of my favorite scenes is when the computer's spying on Ron, and then it cuts to him just chucking it in the dumpster. That is a, <laughs> I mean, you could decide to do it that way to get rid of all of the spying on your anyways no never mind um <laughs> uh pavlov you're up then the uh, labrador farm you are next and laura one of the lauras lauren's lauren b you're your third and i'll again i'm going to be moving people uh down who've already spoken just to give more room go ahead pavlov or is this anthony yeah this is me hey everyone hey hi anthony hey. hey jen how's it going good to meet you verbally i know we've exchanged emails good to hear your voice same all right. Um, isn't Twitter great? Like dog Twitter, just like Twitter and spaces and like, let's like acknowledge Bunsen, Beaker, Pavlov, John, Golden Ratio, Walter, Nelson, like we're all in one place. Like that's, we're in different countries, but all in the same place. That's awesome. Um, so I'll get to the point. Uh, Jen, this question is for you. Like you are in, in 
what I would call an ace of all trades. What you do academically, what you do personally, what you do on social media, you are an, an ace at so many things. And you get acknowledgement for so many things, like your academic work and the things you do with the dogs. But something you probably don't get the chance to talk a lot about is the social media work. Earlier, you described the golden ratio as a social media empire. And I love that because that's some wordage that I've used, too. Is it's, a, it's a freaking empire. And it's an empire not because of the followers or the likes, but how much work we've put into this and how much talent it takes in order to get do the things that we've done. And there are so few social media empires out there. And there's like a few of us in this room, which is some. So like this is a very shrink like question for you, Jen, is as we're able to take a step back and take acknowledge the hard work and skill that goes into building a social media empire. What does it all mean to you? What does the golden ratio as a social media empire mean to you considering all that you've put into it? That, that is such a shrink like question. <laughs> I love it so much. Um, yeah, you know, it's a hard thing to talk about except with people who do it, right? Like uh, Blair Braver did a podcast last week with Outside Magazine. And, uh, and you know, we were explaining to the, the guy recording it, like, you know, Blair and I will call each other on the phone sometimes to just be like, Blair, like these people on the internet were mean to me. And like, nobody's really going to understand what it's like to like run a dog social media empire, except maybe other people who are doing it. And like the stuff that comes with that, which is, usually great but there's hard parts with it too there's you know pressure that you put on yourself and um you know i mean our followers the almost every single one of them is like supportive and wonderful but you'll occasionally get like somebody who's demandy or like why haven't you posted the video for today and it's like man like, do you know what I was cleaning up for three hours between like 2 a.m. and 5 a.m.? Uh, and and so there's some there's, you know, a pressure part, too. And even when people don't say anything, um, we want to make stuff that's good. And, and we know the really positive impact it has on people and we don't want to let them down. Um, but I would say, you know, in terms of what it means, because it's a lot of things which which you understand and certainly other people who run these big accounts understand, um, you know, ultimately what it comes down to is like we started the Golden Ratio account um, shortly after the 2016 election because, you know, as someone who's immersed in social media in my work, um, everything there was angry. I was angry. I think everyone's angry, <laughs> no matter who you supported in the election, right? Like I am not a Trump supporter. Um, I was really angry that he got elected, but the Trump supporters were angry at everybody else too. So everybody was just angry all the time. And I'm like, I need a space that's not angry. <laughs> and I have at the time four golden retrievers. So I'm, I'm just going to post some pictures of them. And, you know, I expected we'd get maybe 2000 followers, you know, not, you know, a hundred thousand, whatever, 130,000 on Twitter. And, I think we have 400,000 on Snapchat. I mean, it's, it's grown into something we didn't expect. And for me, like what it is at this point and, you know, has been for a few years since it got big is it's really a way for us to bring like the, the really deep joy that we get from these dogs to a lot of other people. And we have heard from these people what an impact that has on them. You know, we, we've had, half a dozen people send us like letters in the mail that have had some version of the story that like I was suicidal and I wouldn't get out to watch your videos or whatever. I wouldn't get out of bed and I wouldn't do anything except I just decided to wait and watch your video the next day. And, and that kind of got me through those periods. And, you know, that's the really profound one side. And then the other side is like, there's people just kind of who casually follow us who, you know, dogs suddenly pop up in their feed and it, it makes them for that, that little bit. And, and we can kind of take the joy that we have, like us two people and six dogs and, and really multiply it out to this, this big group of people. If it stopped making people happy, we would probably stop doing it. Um, but that's, that's a really profound and important thing for us and kind of what we started with that it, that it was a way to kind of bring some of this joy that we feel really lucky to have out. And, uh, and that's in there. And, you know, of course, intellectually, it's interesting for me as someone who knows how social media works to do this, right. I have a lot of fun playing with it. Um, but I would probably stop and like play with some other 
experimental stuff. You know, I've got all those side accounts. If, if the golden ratio stopped making people happy like that, that magnification of the joy is really the, the core thing for me, for sure. Thanks for that. Jen. that's lovely. Um, just like as a related note, I, I found that what brought us to Twitter and what kept us on Twitter was the election and the intersection of how much joy dogs bring to people and how interconnected politics and Twitter are, and that you can just kind of squeeze a dog picture as a timeline cleanse in between these doom scrolling posts. And um, that just kind of helped us too. So um, just again, yeah. thanks for you and um, thanks for sharing the dogs with us. Thanks. We, we have emails to exchange. I'll talk to you soon. I'll get back to you. I, I can't say soon, but as soon as I can. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> Brilliant question. Um, yeah. You get emotional when you think about it. Um, our account isn't quite as big as yours on Twitter, but we do get those messages and it makes you, it, it makes me stop and think, right? The best part, some of the best parts of my day, because I have a wonderful job that I just adore, but some parts of my day are the dogs. And if I could share that with people um, and bring them as much joy as these two goofballs bring me, um, I, what a gift to the world. And then also the gift you give to everybody with your dogs too, Jen. We all need a little bit more of that, you know, <laughs> from strangers and from people we know, like just the, the kind of casual kindness and casual happiness is, is a, a really valuable thing in life. It's a currency that, I run out of really quickly. And, and if you give it freely to people, it just kind of refills their tank. Uh, totally. Well put. Hmm. Um, okay. So I guess we'll go. go. <laughs> I've lost track. I was just so deep in thought here. Uh, Labrador farm. I think I've said you're next. Then uh, we'll get through the Laurens, Lauren B and Lauren R and then Liz, your fourth and then Anna. So uh, Jen, do you have another half an hour? Is that okay? I think what's going to yeah. take a half an hour. Yeah. Okay. I have a half an hour. This is important work here. <laughs> Go ahead, Labrador. Farm. Good day. No, it's Dave here. Um, I just wanted to go the the, uh, the sentiment of the last uh, question and and conversation there that yeah, that dogs certainly bring a, a special joy to uh, to social media that can be at times quite toxic. Um, and also thanks to John earlier for his question. That was actually one of my backup questions as well. Uh, so I just want to be real brief. Now, you already touched on it briefly earlier uh, about things like data and privacy issues and friend and group suggestions, advertising, stuff like that. Um, but my question was specifically with, regarding uh, what are some other ethical components that you've encountered within the AI and social media research? Oh, I mean, is that one of your Labradors I just heard in the background? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh by far, like the biggest issue, uh, you know, that we haven't really talked about yet is the bias issue. So, you know, the way artificial intelligence works, like at the core level, right, you want to build AI to do a thing, is that you give it a bunch of examples of how people have done the thing before, and it learns to do it the way that people did it, and then it can replicate that. So, um, you know, that's it. You give it a ton of examples, and it's like, okay, like now those examples. And... The problem with that is that in a lot of these cases, the examples are biased because society is biased and people are biased. And so then the AI becomes biased too. And it, it can happen in ways that are, uh, you know, some really reflect deep social justice problems and then some reflect way more complicated issues. So, you know, just on kind of opposite ends, you look at like, um, like old school Google ads, right? The ads that show up next to your search and, yep. and there's research that shows, for example, that like, if you do a neutral search, so you search for a pair of sneakers that if you're in like a upper middle-class white suburb, you know, in addition to ads for sneakers, you're going to get ads for, or like SAT prep or uh, grocery stores. And if you're in a poor urban black neighborhood, you're going to get ads for bail bondsmen. And that's reflecting bias, right? Mm. And if you're, if you're a teenager in a black neighborhood and you do a completely neutral search and Google tells you maybe you're interested in bail bondsmen, that really makes an impression on you of how the world thinks of you and what you need. There's real impacts from that. Um, 
and and that's a sort of casual thing that like on one hand it's accurate in that <laughs> there may be more searches in uh black neighborhoods than in the white suburbs for all kinds of other complicated reasons for bail bondsmen but that doesn't mean that like that's what we want the algorithms doing um yes. you know the flips the kind of opposite end of that i there's a study that just recently came out about um, hospital systems and and this is going to get a little us specific so um there's big hospital systems here in the U S that have, you know, millions of patients across the country. And, and there was some program where basically for people with a bunch of complicated conditions, say like heart disease and diabetes, stuff that, you know, all came together to make them have very complex health situations. They built an algorithm that would decide, should these people be referred to this kind of intensive program that has a whole bunch of like therapists and physicians working with them to help manage their care. And it's an expensive program, but it's effective. So you want to refer people who are sick enough that they're going to benefit and not just send everybody there where there you're spending a lot of money that it, they don't necessarily need that level of care. And what researchers found that he did is that, Black people had to be way sicker than white people to get referred to the program. But the algorithm didn't look at race. It just looked at how much, it, you know, it looked at their medical records. And it, what it predicted was how much is their future health care going to cost? And it predicted that really accurately. But it turns out white patients are way more expensive than black patients because they get more surgeries and they see more specialists. And that's because of all kinds of historical, complicated social racial justice issues. And so since white patients are more expensive, they're getting referred to the program more. And if you were to make it fair, about 18 percent of black patients were getting referred to the program. But if you made it so they got referred when they were as sick as the white patients, it was like 48 percent would actually get referred. So it's a huge gap. And, wow. you know, that it's because society is complicated and it's also biased. And so that ends up in all of these algorithms in all kinds of ways. And it's not the kind of thing where you can go, oh, well, we'll just tell the algorithm to ignore race because it's embedded deep inside all of that data. Um, and the same with gender and the same with religion and the same with sexual orientation, like all of those societal biases, their way in there. It is a huge problem. Um, and it's really hard to detect. It's almost impossible to build algorithms that don't have it. And you have to then engineer from the back end. At, we don't, we're still figuring out how to do it. I mean, we have active research conferences in my research space, you know, looking at how to deal with fairness and transparency and all of that. But it's, it's a huge problem. And it's one that I think is not understood well enough that we can even really regulate it at this point. Like we've got some, some sort of rules, like you can't be biased about this, but we don't know how to solve it yet. Um, so, so that I think is just a massive problem that, uh, you know, we hadn't talked about yet, but is omnipresent in every one of these algorithms in one way or another. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you. Thanks. Great question. Uh, Jen, have the uh, AI researcher, Dr. Janelle Shane, have you heard of Dr. Shane? Yes. Oh, she, I, when I interviewed her on the podcast, that's what she talked about. And it's like they, the, this company built an algorithm to hire people and they wanted it to be general neutral. But when they ran it, it only wanted to hire men. And what they found out, it was like the data they fed it was based on current hires, which were mostly men. And it had sniffed out all of these teeny tiny wisps of traces and of the job posting or people applying that were female. Like if somebody had said they played women's hockey, you just the algorithm just like, nope, just like kick them all out. Um, so she said you have that's an, that's just so interesting that you brought that up because uh, Dr. Shane also brought that up. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, that was Amazon. And it was at Amazon? Okay, yeah. It was yeah. Amazon trying to hire software engineers. They spent like three years building that, and they ended up having to scrap the whole thing. And they yeah. did the kind of naive, like, well, we'll just take the word women out of the resumes. And that does it. You know, the AI is smart enough to figure it out, even without that word in there. Um, hmm. And they had, you know, you imagine the amount of money they put into having a team spend three yeah. years on that. Yeah, and she they just said have millions. Yeah, she For said sure. million, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars potentially. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, Lauren B, then Lauren R. So the Laurens, you're up. And then Liz. Uh, and again, I will have to knock some people down out of being speakers in a bit. I, it's not that I don't want to just have to make room. 
Uh, go ahead, Lauren B. Oh, hi, Professor Golbeck. I'm a really big fan about the golden ratio and all of your work. I'm actually one of the, I'm an information science student. I'm taking a break right now from um, my inf information security homework. Um, I have a couple of questions. First question is, have you had any instances where your fun project with the golden ratio has tied in with your professional work, like work, um, maybe analyzing the GR content in your private, um, in your lab at the University of Maryland. Uh, I, it's just like the ethical implications. Um, or do you think just it, ethically, just it would make the lab pretty biased? That's a great question. So I have made the very explicit uh, decision from the beginning not to do any experiments on our own data. <laughs> so, so that means I don't do experiments like with the posts that I make, you know, and I also don't study the followers. Um, so, I mean, I'll test stuff out, right? I'll be like, oh, if I post you know, a video in reels, you know, does that do better than if I post the video in the story? Like just for my own curiosity, but I, I don't do research on any of our data. Um, that said, I have I've explicitly asked our followers, like, if any of you want to participate in my research experiments, you can sign up. So I have a mailing list of, you know, maybe 3000 people who have volunteered. And so, you know, a couple times a year, I'll ask them, you know, could you do this 20 minute survey? And uh, I send them a picture of the dog that I haven't posted online and, uh, and they take the survey. So it's a way that like I can leverage some of that interest. Um, uh, but I never, never do experiments with our, our posts on our audience, exactly for what you said. Um, for, for people who aren't researchers, if you do any research with human subjects, even if you just ask them to fill out a survey, um, or if you're studying their responses to something, you have to get what we call IRB approval. So it's an ethics board approval. Um, it's the same, same kind of review if you were studying a cancer drug. Um, obviously, it's easier to get ours than if you're giving people an experimental medicine. But it comes from a history of really atrociously, <laughs> um, offensively unethical experiments that have been done on people, um, not just medically, but also you know, in psychology and um, in all sorts of spaces. So all my work requires ethics approval. And that means everybody has to explicitly consent to being part of an experiment. So I, even if I wanted to, I couldn't. Um, but I, you know, I, I have a really strict firewall there of not doing any, um, like research analysis on our posts. Which I really appreciate as somebody who's also studying information law, policy and ethics. It's just, it would just put in too many, it, it would just put in too many bad things. Um, and then my second question is where are like, could you give me ex examples of like the favorite spots that the dogs like to be petted? I know that Thingman's ears are very <laughs> soft and I feel like walks like neck scruff would be a fun place to pet him. Like, <laughs> so do you have any other favorite spots that they like to be rubbed like belly rubs or anything? So, you know, we don't have any big belly rub lovers. I mean, they will all accept, um, they, they pretty much universally top of their butt above their tail scratched. And uh, Voodoo and I have a current process. He's just a, he's on, a, he's one of our epileptic dogs for those of you who don't follow. He's on a lot of medicine. So he's, he's kind of like those sloths in that animated movie where he just moves really slow. <laughs> and so it's always a challenge to get him to engage. So we do a little thing where I'm like, all right, Voods, we're going to do it. And I like start with his head and then I go to his shoulder blades and then I do his side and then I rub his butt and his legs and kind of come back up. And then usually after a couple rounds of that, he'll maybe wag his tail a couple times. So he needs like the full body fast massage. Um, but, but butt rubs are absolutely the number one <laughs> preferred type of rub for everybody in the house. <laughs> so good. Thank you so much, Professor Goldback. Thanks. That was a brilliant, Lauren. A, uh, a deep policy ethical question followed by where the heck should we rub the dogs? <laughs> That's great. Um, is the other Lauren still here? Oh, we lost one of the Laurens. No. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. So we lost one of the Laurens. Um, Liz, you're up. And then I believe Anna. And then I'm going to start moving people around after that. So Liz, go ahead. And then Anna. I see people requesting. I don't know if we're going to get to you all. We're, I'm trying. Um, go ahead, Liz. Hey, happy Tuesday. 
Um, I just had a question for you, Doc. Um, not about the dogs, but we're we're fairly similar in age. And I remember growing up being female, expressing any interest in anything STEM was just, you know, taboo. Like, it, it, that, that's the boys club, you know? So did you run into any issues um, being in the comp sci field or being in the STEM field as a female or any barriers or kind of what was your experience like and how can we encourage more females to get into STEM besides giving them beaker magnets? <laughs> Man, so, so much. Um, you know, in, in high school, uh, so I, I grew up in a, a pretty rural town in Northern Illinois. And in high school, I, I was like the first junior to take AP chemistry and uh and I I was smart right I did good at it and I remember the teacher there telling me that he thought I was basically going to fail the test at the end and um you know I aced the test at the end but he was still telling people my cousins I have a big giant family and my cousins went to the school so like you know 15 years later he was saying to my cousins like, oh yeah, I had a junior take this class once and she only signed up because her boyfriend was in the class. He was talking about me. I didn't take it because my boyfriend was in the class, but like that was the story that he told. And just like that narrative still drives me crazy. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I had it early on and then, um, you know, there was this point in the eighties where women were, you know, equally represented in computer science. And then what happens is that as the field becomes prestigious, that men think it's their field and women kind of get pushed out, uh, which is what happened. And so I was in college, you know, in kind of the late nineties into early two thousands where there was a real dip in the number of women. Um, it was kind of dot com time. So it was more prestigious. And that means the men think it's their space and, and the women get bumped out. Um, you know, by the time I was a PhD student, and this is certainly true in computer science, as you move up um, the kind of the ladder in academia, there's fewer and fewer women. So I was usually the only woman in, in a class of 20 getting my PhD. And um, it was a huge problem. I'm just the kind of casual sexist comments from students, but also very serious harass sexual harassment from a couple faculty members, um, you know, that easily could have made me go, I'll just go get my PhD in this slightly adjacent department in math, right? Which like I could have done. I have to deal with this. Um, so it was really problematic. Um, and it, it was a struggle kind of all the way. Um, I mean, you know, I still get those kind of comments. I mean, I have a, I have a TikTok for myself as a professor um, that's very popular. And man, like the comments I get over there on TikTok when I talk about stuff that I literally have a PhD in and, you know, some high school dude just has stuff that he decides he wants to say, um, like the casual misogyny is high still uh, for women in computing. Uh, you know, the, the problem is so complicated because it, it really starts kind of at the late middle school is where we start seeing women getting driven away from STEM in general, and then especially like math and computer science. Um, so I, you know, I don't have great solutions to that, but I, you know, one part of it that I think I've worked really hard at is just the representation side, right? I had, there was one female computer science professor when I was a, a PhD student, uh, out, out of a big faculty, right? Um, having more information, I, I think is really important. And, you know, not just in women, but computing, we're just not diverse um, in terms of people of color, you know, black, black professors, you know, men or women, Hispanic, there's, there's hardly any, um, it's kind of white and Asian men. And so, um, you know, a lot of the kind of non-research side of my work has been, um, you know, pushing very hard kind of in the spaces of academia to get more representation in all of those spaces, um, any underrepresented groups, whatever they happen to be in the field, um, to get more of them because that, um, that at least addresses one side of the problem, right? People, we know from, from the literature that people are more likely to stay in a field if there's people who look like them, who are, you know, ab above them, say teaching them in that field. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of problems to solve, but that's, that's one, I think where we can do better. And, and at least, you know, I'm trying to work on that and make it do better. Thanks for the question, Liz.
Um, Jen, you'll be happy to know that uh, in our high school, because I teach high school chemistry, um, we have we have more girls in in high school chemistry than we have boys, and that's a constant thing. There's trending more females than men. Of course, you eventually want to get where it's fifty fifty, but I think we have to skew it the little way, the other way for a while here. So. I mean, they. somebody once asked Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, how many women is the right number to have on the Supreme Court? And she said, all of them. Because yeah. it had been all men for a long time. Like, why not? <laughs> right. Um, so so, you know, that when I heard that quote for the first time, which is quite a while ago, it kind of shifted my thinking. And we don't really need to be the same. It'd be fine for a while to have a lot more women doing the thing that <laughs> we traditionally haven't been allowed to. Yeah. I mean, if it's good for a hundred years to not have a single woman, I, I don't, I know nothing about um, your Supreme Court. I'm sorry, it's like a foreign body to me. But anyways, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing for a while it was only men that Absolutely. was on the thing. Absolutely. Okay, all right. <laughs> I do know who Ruth Bader Ginsburg is. I've seen people dress up for, as her for Halloween, and she was very, very important and inspirational. So I'm not an ignoramus about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, we've got, we've got about eight minutes left. I don't think we're going to get to everybody. Um, we're going to have Anna go, uh, oh, I just clicked on the wrong thing. Uh, go ahead, Anna, and then Katie, and then Tanner. Um, so we'll, we'll go to 8.30. I think that's plenty of time, um, and because Dr. Goldbeck has given up her time so graciously. Um, go ahead, Anna. Hi, Dr. Goldbeck. I'm a huge fan of, um, the Golden Ratio and your podcast. So I have two questions. The first, how is your hamstrings doing? And the second, <laughs> um, how do you think that Apple's like shift towards privacy? Is that like for them actually doing something or is it just for publicity in your opinion? Uh, these are fun questions. So uh, for those of you who do not so closely follow my life that you know about my hamstrings, I've, I've had this hamstring injury for most of the year that makes it uncomfortable to sit like it hurts me to sit. And so I sing this song that goes, someday my butt won't hurt, but today is not that day. And today is still not that day, but it's getting better. And it's good enough that I'm I'm running the Boston Marathon next So, um, you know, hopefully by 2022, I'll be able to sit in a chair for an hour. Uh, we, we can hope someday. Um, thank you for asking. Uh, in terms of Apple, um, you know, again, they're not perfect, but I think they're, uh, I think it's much more than just for show what they're doing. Um, you know, I think they think there is a real competitive advantage towards being the company of privacy and, and that they're, they've made some real concrete steps that have really pissed off a lot of other companies and that that's been good. Um, you know, they've made some missteps lately with their, um, photo scanning tech that they had recently talked about. Um, they put it out talking about dealing with child exploitation and doing some kind of standard versions of scanning for child pornography, which is things that every single cloud co company does. Any, anybody will scan um, your photos in the cloud for known child pornography. There's like a database that the FBI maintains of known photos that they'll, or, and, and what they were doing was fine there, but they were also talking about scanning uh, your messages that you were sending on your iPhone if you were underage to see if there was like nudity in them and then like maybe alerting your parents. And it was very bad. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that's more of a misstep than a trend for them. So this is not to say that they're great and everything they're doing is perfect, but I, I think they've made a smart choice that um, that privacy is really going to be the thing that they're they're going to use to win over customers and and they have taken steps to do that um they're the thing that came out this year where you can block tracking of your phone's id for example is massive in terms of the privacy benefit that has for users and it made the data companies like facebook but many others so angry which is a good sign that it was the right thing to do for people <laughs> so um i don't think it's all for show i think you know it's not perfect but um you know it's certainly cemented my loyalty to that half of the ecosystem. Um, I think they're making the right choices. All right. Thank you so much. Um, have a great rest of your night. Thanks. Thank you for being patient, Anna. Um, I'm going to bump Lauren up. She lost her connection and she was going to speak and then she <clears throat> um, lost her connection. So I'm going to get Lauren to go now because she had, she was on the docket and got booted somehow. 
Go ahead, Lauren. Lauren uh, R. Hi, Dr. Goldbeck. Um, first off, good luck um, with your marathon. Hope everything goes well and that everything stays minimally injury free. Um, as someone that runs somewhere between a 5K and a 10K but is wanting to um, advance distance, what is your one good piece of advice for getting over some of those mental roadblocks blocks when you know it's not something physical? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, so, you know, part of it is like to run farther, you just have to run farther, right? Like that's, that's the advice and it's stupid, um, but it's true. And so, you know, the, the challenge comes like, okay, if you've run a 10 K and say you want to do a half marathon is the next thing, you know, the training plans are just going to have you run six miles this week on the, on Saturday and next week it's going to be seven and next week it's going to be eight. But at some point it's going to be hard, right? Like your legs are going to get heavy and it's going to feel really bad. Um, and you know, the only answer is to just do it again and do it again until it stops hurting and, and you'll get there. Um, but you have to make that mental step through. And really once you get like to half marathons in past, you're shifting into the entirely mental space, right? Like running a hundred miles, isn't that much harder than running 26 miles, except that it's really hard on your brain. <laughs> you know, you have to deal with like stuff hurting, but you know, your body gets trained for it. Um, so the, the tips that I use are, uh, and you know, Anthony from, uh, Pavlov can probably talk to you about the psych of this, but, um, there's a, there's a whole process of basically coupling a positive reward with a thing that you don't want to do. So there, you know, even though I run all the time, there's still days I absolutely do not want to go like put on sunscreen and all of those, you know, fancy running gear and go do it. Like I just want to sit on the couch and watch Netflix. And so I save my favorite podcasts and I only let myself listen to them when I run. And so it just adds that extra thing where it's like, oh, I don't get all the gear on and go and it's hot outside. But like my favorite murder is waiting there for me and I cannot listen to it unless I go for a run. And so it is a thing that both distracts me um, from, you know, if I really don't want to go that far and it kind of gets me going in the first place. Um, I will also say that like, I don't have the healthiest relationship with food. I really use it to reward myself more than I should um, and to cope with stress. But like, I will promise myself sometimes delicious snacks when I get back from a run. And that often will like, let me go do it. Like uh, I could run six miles, but if I run 10, I can eat that cupcake that is waiting for me in the fridge. Um, and, and those sorts of little things to just make it feel more positive. Um, those really have helped me like get over those bumps. And then once it becomes comfortable, it's a lot easier, right? Once you've run eight miles, three times, the fourth time, it's a lot easier than when you start to it. So you can totally do it. And hopefully those things will help. Well, thank you. I feel like that really, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And some of those things I'm already doing, I just need to push myself a little bit further. Hey, hey, hey slow down is also my, my top advice to everyone. Just try it slower and it'll probably feel better. <laughs> well, thank Thanks. you. Um, we have time for one more question. I'm so sorry for the people that won't have their questions answered. And there were like, like 30 questions on direct message. Um, so I, I just have to apologize for that. It just shows the popularity of, of this topic tonight. Um, uh, Katie, you've been waiting the longest. Uh, I know there's some other people I brought up to speak, but Katie, you'll have the last question and then we'll close out the space tonight. Go ahead, Katie. Hi. Um, just one big fan of both of you guys. Um, especially because I unfortunately couldn't bring my dog to uh, the place I'm living now. So I kind of live vicariously through you guys. Um, so my question is, I just started a PhD program and I'm kind of having some issues balancing my workload and my research load. So um, Dr. Goldbeck, I was uh, wondering if you had any suggestions on balancing the two and kind of getting my research off to a really good start. So are you, working like a job job in addition to your PhD? Like, is that the, the work side against their side? Um, no, you have to like TA um, as part of my funding, but most of it is just like um, classwork and then research. 
Oh, sure. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's so tricky. I mean, the good news is this is a problem that'll go for away for you in whatever, two years, <laughs> which I know sounds like a really long time. Um, it's It's hard to balance. So look, I mean, don't put a ton of pressure on yourself in that first, certainly in the first year and kind of into the second to do too much original research. Um, and you know, I know that depends on your advisor and like your lab and what the expectations are there. Um, but a lot of your job is to like learn the stuff for the classes at the beginning. So, and I, I certainly was like, start publishing papers right now. Like I'm going to start doing this stuff. And as much as you are capable of being gentle with yourself about your expectations at the beginning, try to do that because you're going to have tons of other opportunities. Um, but I would also say as much as it's possible, and, it, and this will really vary by your field, um, see how much you can incorporate your research into the coursework. Um, you know, in computer science, we had very project oriented classes. And so, uh, you know, even if I was taking a class on, you know, whatever game theory, um, I could kind of find a way that game theory connected to stuff that I cared about and, you know, do say predict in that course, something that matched up with my research or at least leveraged other work I was doing. Um, so if it's possible to do that, you know, sometimes it's just not, and, and that's what it is. Um, do that. And I, I will give you just one other kind of broader piece of advice, um, which I give a lot when I'm talking to kind of newer PhD students, which doesn't exactly answer your question, but I, I think will help maybe. I, I have consistently in my career, like from undergrad to now, <laughs> run into a problem in my brain where I go, the kind of hardcore, awesome research to do would be this thing. Like for me in computer science, it was like, oh, I'm going to be a theorist, right? This is like the super mathy part of computer science. I'm going to be a theorist. And then even when I got into AI, like I'm going to build, you know, build AI algorithms like from the ground up. This is a lot of calculus. I suck at calculus. <laughs> I, I am a master of like matrix algebra, which is the other half of computer science. I could calculus, but I'm like, the more hardcore thing to do would be the calculus. So the more hardcore thing to do would be this. So I'll be a real computer scientist that people will respect if I do those things. Because the other things are easy for me. And, and so I would get into these traps where I'd be doing stuff that was hard and also I was not good at. And it turns out the stuff I was good at was also hard for other people. I was just good at it. And so because it felt easy, it felt like maybe it's like not as hardcore and and not as respectable or not as well respected. Um, I have done so many that were like so hard for me that I didn't enjoy because I thought it's the thing that I should be doing. And then later realized the stuff that feels like natural and good to me is actually really great. And I do an amazing job at it because like, that's where my natural talents lie. Um, and I could have, I could have been so much more productive and saved myself so much heartache if I had just kind of followed what felt natural and good in my intellectual journey, because that's what my brain is good at. And, and I'm better than anybody else at solving those kinds of problems. And so I would just say, like, keep that kind of thing in mind, like be open with yourself. So if you're trying to solve a certain kind of problem and you find it very frustrating and you're just naturally drawn to something kind of two steps over to the left, maybe that's the thing that you should be doing. Um, and especially in your first couple of years, like you have a lot of freedom to explore those. Um, it, I think it's a real message when something feels like natural and fun and exciting and, and don't allow any of those as much as you can don't allow those expectations. Like I, but I really want to be this kind of academic to steer you away from uh, the topics that, that actually spark you because those are likely where your where your skills and talents naturally lie and it, it'll evolve over time. But, uh, yeah. Also, look, I mean, like real talk, being a PhD student sucks for a while. It's really hard and it's a ton of work and people burn out. Um, so don't feel alone. Like you will get through it. Um, and there's support groups maybe cause you know, there's, there's kind of no way to make it easy. Um, they, it's, it's a little bit of, of torture <laughs> along with the. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So far it's been a little rough and I 
I understand. I'm not very math either. And my program is very math centric, unfortunately. So uh, thank you. for Good luck. And feel free to drop me a DM if you want to like dig into like real details. Like this is, I don't want to get too far into like my kind of grad student mentoring space here, but I'd be totally happy to talk to you about it, you know, and we can dig into the weeds uh, in a separate space. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. That's great advice, Jen. Thanks for sharing that with somebody. Um, <laughs> I have such respect for people that pursue anything past uh, an undergrad, right? I have two undergrads. Um, I'm a high school chemistry teacher. And what I wasn't good at was the research, but what I loved doing was the presentations. <laughs> so that probably explains why yeah. I'm a, why I'm a, I was the person like, hey, get this guy to do the talking. He's the talky guy. And I was as good at that. So I just have respect for people that can do the research and enjoy that kind of stuff because you just make better scientists that way. So um, we're at, I'm kind of rambling anyways, uh, at, we're at the end of the space. Thank you so much for giving up um, your time tonight. This has been an, hello, oh, hello, uh, Did you mom? Oh, sorry, Kate, okay, somebody was there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks for giving up your time, uh, this, this evening, Jen, um, this went way over, but we had overwhelming, an overwhelming, uh, response to you being a guest tonight. So thank you so much. It was super fun. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm getting probably 30 messages and, uh, replies to have you back spaces unleashed. Um, and it, we're booked up right till Christmas. I've got guests all the way up to Christmas. Would you be willing to come back next year sometime? Of course. Anytime. Awesome. Okay. So, so people were listening, you can stop direct messaging me about having Jen back. Uh, she said yes next year sometime. Awesome. Um, next week, our guest is the amazing Joey ramp. You might know Joey ramp. She has Samson, uh, service dog. Um, she has done an amazing work getting, uh, service dogs in to help, um, people working on their science degrees. Uh, if you don't know who Samson Service Dog is or Joey Ramp, give them a, a look-see. Please follow The Golden Ratio. Please follow um, Dr. Jen Goldback. Check out, you guys, right? Like you have a link right in The Golden Ratio to check out your merch. Um, yep, yep, everything yeah, in the bio. Yeah, in the bio. Okay, thank you very much. Any closing words before we go? Uh, you know, just find spaces that me online, like we've talked about all this scary stuff, but like find some stuff that makes you happy and spend more time there than you are. And it's going to be good for your life. <laughs> dog Twitter is a good place. To yeah, for sure. <laughs> all right. Take care, doc. Thank you so much. You are, you just rock. Thank you. It was so fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this was great. Okay. Take care, everybody. Uh, we're not going to do Bunsen and Beaker overtime because we're like 40 minutes overtime. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, we'll see you guys next week. Oh, I have something exciting to, to announce. Um, I have guests booked all the way up till Christmas, including Matt from We Rate Dogs. So I'll let you guys know when he's going to be on, uh, spaces. Some people might like to hear that. Um, he said he'd be on spaces. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week with, uh, Joey Ramp and Samson Service Dog. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.